Good morning. Welcome to the second iteration of the validity evidence based on content and cognitive slash linguistic processes. Um, I don't know if any of you were at the panel yesterday. I understand it was robust and well attended. Um, and uh, so, so we'll have a, an opportunity to have a similar conversation, although some of the panelists are the same and, and there are a couple of differences. So I am Jessica McKinney. I work at the Office of State Support within the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education at the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, and I'm pleased to moderate this panel. I will just briefly open it up by introducing the four members of our panel. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll note from their experience that the panel really balances research and practitioners um, representing academia, state, and industry. Uh, experience and, and many of them have some or all of that experience. Um, and then we'll get into to brief, review, uh, brief remarks uh, by the panelists uh, followed by questions. So uh, as you think of things while they are speaking, please make, make notes. We do anticipate plenty of time for, for question and, and answer. Uh, so the first member of the panel is Ryan Kettler who's an associate professor in school psychology at Rutgers, uh, the State University of New Jersey. <coughs> Dr. Kettler's research focuses on data-based decision-making in education, uh, and he's actively engaged in uh, research on universal screening, inclusive assessment, and educator <coughs> effectiveness. He's been a principal investigator or co-principal investigator on seven grant project projects, including three funded by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, we also have Dr. Jeff Hogger, the Director of Assessments at the New Jersey Department of Education. Uh, he studied at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and was co-chair of Parks Research and Psychometric Committee. Uh, has worked closely with vendors and states on um, the peer review submission. I should say all of our panel members have been peer reviewers for assessment peer review, so they bring uh, a wealth of expertise from, from that vantage point as well. Um, and then we have Will Laurier, a psychometrician, currently an independent consultant. Um, he has experience with McGraw-Hill, ETS, the World Bank, and Pearson, working on large-scale testing programs both in the U.S. and abroad, uh, including designing the first national mathematics and science tests given in the state of Qatar, um, as well as Department of Defense contracts on uh, linguistic proficiency for nine strategic languages. Most recently, he's been working on an algorithm for sub-score free diagnostic reporting and a method for standardizing the scoring of technology enhanced items. This year, he was awarded a small business innovative research grant through the Institute for Education Sciences to develop an AI system for helping English language learners improve their conversation skills. And finally, Jack Zoon is the Vice President of Content Special Projects at AIR. His staff led test development as the Vice President of Content and Test Development uh, for AIR Assessment for the past 18 years. Uh, and AIR develops more than 10,000 items annually, aligned to state standards, um, which may include the Common Core State Standards or Next Generation Science Standards. Uh, she's been pr primarily responsible for the development of items and the assembly of test forms for all of AIR's assessment projects. Before joining AIR, Zach worked at ETS for 12 years, managing verbal test development for numerous projects, including work on the GRE, GMAT, LSAT, SAT, NAEP, and Praxis. So as you can see, again, a wealth of experience from multiple vantage points. So the panel has decided to sort of divide up some of the information about content uh, and cognitive linguistic processes, and uh, we'll, we'll each speak briefly, and then again, we'll circle back for questions. Uh, so I will turn it over to Dr. Kettler. Good morning. Thanks again for joining us. So I just want to start by briefly talking about the topic of overall validity. Uh, which is subsumed in the peer review guidance at the beginning of 3.1 on content validity, although to my thinking overall validity 
or construct validity is probably more accurately described as uh, an umbrella term that the other types of validity evidence feed into or uh, collectively compose. So overall, a construct validity can be thought of as the degree which accurate inferences can be drawn from a test score because that score represents uh, the construct that it's intended to represent. In the types of tests that we're talking about, that means the degree to which a reading score represents broadly reading, the degree to which a math score represents math, science scores are the, the construct that are being represented in science. And as I mentioned, so to my thinking, the types of evidence in 3.1 through 3.4, content validity evidence, validity evidence based on response processes, internal structure validity evidence, and evidence based on relations to other variables, uh, all feed into construct validity. You may be familiar with the phrase, all validity evidence is construct validity evidence. Uh, for, for the most part, that would be attributed to Samuel Messick's writings on the topic uh, from a couple of decades ago. And the emphasis is also uh, that not each of these types of evidence should be equally weighted necessarily or included in equal degrees in terms of evaluating each different types of scores, but that collectively these four different types of evidence can be used to build an argument uh, for the inferences and interpretations from the test score. So what's new in this area? Well, the specific language is the state has documented adequate overall validity evidence for its assessments consistent with nationally recognized professional and technical testing standards. Uh, the best known of these standards are the Standards for Educational and Psychological Testing revised a couple years ago by a joint committee of the American Educational Research Association, the American Psychological Association, and the National Council on Measurement and Education. And if you follow the uh, validity part of the critical elements 3.1 through 3.4, they pretty closely align with those standards that were mapped out by AERA, APA, and NCME. So, uh, the evidence in 3.1 through 3.4 that I've just mentioned are all relevant and are all critical to that basic inference that you want to make from the test score. Uh, again, which is that that reading score represents reading, that that math score represents how an individual student is doing in mathematics. And the validity chapters and technical reports that you put together as part of your evidence should, in almost all cases, address each of those four types of evidence for each of your various uh, assessments. Another thing that should be addressed and is included in the critical element to be addressed in your validity chapter is any inferences, interpretations, purposes, or uses of your test score. And this gets to the idea that validity evidence is not speaking to a property of a test score, but is speaking to how we use the test score, the inferences, the interpretations, and the uses of it. And uh, Michael Caine has probably most prominently written in this area and gets this idea uh, attributed mostly to his uh, seminal writing on the, inter uh, the importance of interpretations and uses when you're determining how to build a validity evidence argument uh, for your assessment or for the scores from your assessment. And his point was that uh, once you identify those interpretations and those uses, those can guide uh, how you're going to collect validity evidence, which different types of areas you want to make sure to emphasize. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples of how that can come into play. Uh, so if you're solely making the argument of that, about that basic inference uh, that the reading score represents reading, the math score represents math, uh, then having a good collection of evidence from those four areas uh, will suffice. If you're going a step beyond that, for example, saying that that math score, when aggregated at the teacher or the building level, uh, averaged or aggregated in some other way, represents how well a teacher performs or a school or a district performs, then reliability and validity evidence should really be collected at that aggregated or averaged level rather than just relying on reliability and validity evidence for the individual score and then making an assumption that you can make inferences about mean scores across teachers, districts, or schools. Uh, a second example, if you're going to be using a growth score, like a student growth percentile or a conditional growth index uh, to make inferences about how well students are doing or teachers or districts, then the reliability and validity evidence should really be gathered about how reliable uh, those scores are and how valid inferences from those scores are. So you should be looking at uh, 
relations with other variables for your student growth percentiles, your conditional growth indices, rather than just the uh, status scores on which those are based or from which those are calculated. A third example, if some of your intended uses or purposes or interpretations are connected to intervention programming, then there really should be some evidence indicating that students who are low in certain areas benefit from the types of interventions you're going to connect them to. And really, good evidence would show that they disproportionately benefit from these interventions. And I know that that's really difficult, uh, uh, costly evidence to gather. Uh, if you were making the statement, though, that these low scores in these, low area, in these certain areas uh, should lead a student to receiving certain interventions, you really need to show that students with these profiles benefit uh, specifically from these interventions. So those are my remarks on uh, overall or construct validity. And I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Hogger uh, to receive content validity. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, I, so I'm just going to go over the content validity. And I think there's some um, questions uh, reviewing uh, the peer review, um, what we've seen <coughs> that has been good evidence, and um, some uh, things that uh, could definitely be worked on. But overall, I, I want to draw that one thing that the new peer review guidance has in the content validity um, that they've added and they've really highlighted is that documentation that the assessments address the depth and breadth of the content standards. And that is really is highlighting this new um, peer review process. And so when you look at alignment studies to uh, measure the alignment between your standards and your assessment, you just don't want to look at the breadth. And that has been something common that states have done. You really have to go into the, the depth as well, particularly now with our new standards that a lot of states are doing where they're getting uh, more complex. Um, about those studies, uh, the, the, the uh, content uh, validity studies, really you want to have an independent source to verify rather than just your vendor. Um, I, I think it's very important to have, you know, you can work with a research institution or another group to uh, conduct these studies. Um, you know, the method of the alignment studies, I, I, I don't think is matters and it's not really called out in the peer review process, but I do think it's important that whatever method you use are consistent with, as the peer review says, uh, recognized, uh, nationally recognized uh, technical standards. And so I think that's the bare minimum and something that when states submit their uh, peer review process, it's really important to, uh, in the notes, to address you know, how this fits in to the overall uh, validity argument and, and you know, give peer reviewers um, you know, a little bit of, of evidence or, and guidance about what to expect in the content um, evidence. I think that will really help the peer reviewers out in uh, deciphering uh, what materials to look at and review. And I say that um, sort of as best practice because what we've seen is many times states, um, for various reasons, and I'm guilty myself, would just do a study and just put it into the peer review process and expect the peer reviewers to understand what the evidence is and where to find it. So I think you want to really be direct um, and really, you know, I, I think states don't utilize the, the comment section as well to sort of build that story of the, the validity evidence um, that you're uh, seeing. So I, I really recommend, you know, um, going forward with peer review process, uh, you know, independent um, reviewers, if you can, for the alignment studies. Um, you know, the methodology just uh, doesn't, I, would, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter, but just use something that is, uh, you know, nationally recognized and has, uh, you know, technical standards. And um, really for states to uh, clearly address how this um, information addresses the content validity and how uh, it's structured within the validity um, argument. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Will. some brief remarks on uh, 3.2, which is uh, looking at cognitive processes. Uh, one of the things I've seen done really well in um, 
in the peer review was when when, it's, um, when this critical element has been addressed is um, uh, cognitive labs, Cog but specifically cognitive labs that lay out as a research study lay out their research questions. Um, explain their methodology, the sample uh, findings, and importantly, what they, what the program is going to do with the findings. If they find that something is not what they expected, what the what the program's plan is is for that. Um, other ways uh, that are specified in the evidence for 3.2, uh, admissible evidence for 3.2, um, are. Uh, having expert judgments um, on the cognitive processes. Uh, at least from my perspective, I think the cognitive labs are sort of the gold standard for this, but you can also use expert judgment to uh, determine or to uh, lay out an argument for the cognitive processes, uh, that, that, that cognitive processes that you intend to tap into with your test are actually the, the, indeed the ones that students are using <coughs> in responding to uh, test items. Uh, in, in those cases, I as a peer reviewer would look to the um, composition of the, of the expert panel. Um, what is their process? Do they uh, lay out, do, do they look at the specific, you know, do they um, uh, list the specific cognitive processes for particular <coughs> parts of the test? and how do they go about making judgments that those cognitive processes are indeed um, uh, expected of students that are responding correctly to, to those uh, items. Um, but I wanted to back up a little bit on, um, also on cogni uh, cognitive processes because I think one of the most challenging thing for, for uh, submitters in this area is uh, thinking critically about this critical element, which by the way hasn't changed in the new guidance. The only difference is the addition of linguistic processes for ELP assessment. So but the, the <coughs> academic uh, standards part of it hasn't changed in the new guidance. Uh, I think that the, the um, challenge, the most challenging part is to, is for programs to look specifically at the parts of their um, uh, testing program that specify cognitive processes. Um, and the standards, uh, uh, professional uh, and technical standards, uh, were mentioned um, already. I, uh, we look at the standards for educational and psychological testing. And there's some really uh, good information there on response processes. Uh, so page 16 and 17 is very short. Uh, and it lays out uh, sources of evidence for response processes. But importantly, in that section, you'll see that in some cases, cognitive processes are not relevant. So uh, there may be parts of your standards where cognitive processes are really salient, you know, maybe those higher DOK items that you use DOK. Um, but there may be other parts where you're not, uh, that, that aspect of the performance is not salient. So uh, approaching your testing program with that perspective, I think would be uh, very useful um, and uh, would help you uh, kind of focus where it is that you look for evidence of cognitive processes. Uh, beyond that, uh, I just have a couple of uh, suggestions uh, for, um, uh, for a study of uh, cognitive processes. So ask yourself, what is the specific cognitive process for which, or cognitive processes for which you seek evidence, just you know, lay, uh, write them out. Um, what um, then ask yourself what observable student actions or statements would provide evidence for that? Sometimes it's right in the student record of responses. Depends on what type of item or uh, you're, you're dealing with. Um, sometimes you can just ask them um, after they have taken uh, sample items. And by the way, this is something that, this is evidence that you collect um, rather early, typically collected rather early in the testing uh, uh, process, uh, test development process. And um, finally, how, how are you going to create the conditions to elicit those actions or, or um, statements from the students if they are indeed following 
the uh, cognitive uh, targeted cognitive process. I have uh, I, often the examples for this are in math. So I, I tried to look for an example in ELA, and um, I went to the Common Core standards and found that a um, here's a standard for grade nine to ten students in language arts um, that to me this is my opinion implies a particular cognitive process that the standard is aimed at a particular cognitive process. Determine the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in the text, including figurative and connotative meanings. Analyze the cumulative impact of specific word choices on meaning and tone. Um, so I, I think they, they're, um, if, if you're targeting that particular standard, uh, there is, uh, there's a, um, the cognitive process that's implied there is that the student in responding uses the context in answering. So they, they use the context for that word or phrase to make a determination of what it means. So that's that's um, a, a process that you can ask students or observe if they are actually following that process when they're taking items which are targeted to that, that um, uh, uh, standard. Um, so uh, so it, essentially, being very, um, I think being very focused in your search for cognitive processes um, and evidence for cognitive processes is, is important. Um, and, and I don't think this is something you need to do with all of the items in your test. I think, I mean, at least to me as a peer reviewer, a, a thoughtful sampling um, uh, would be, you know, sufficient to um, count as evidence of this. Um, and, uh, yeah, so those, those are the um, comments I have on, on 3.2. Let me turn it over to June. <laughs> I'm also speaking on 3.2. Um, to me, validity doesn't just happen overnight. You're not going to do one study and, okay, my test is valid. Validity happens at the very beginning, and you have to plan for it. And you have to think about evidence-centered design, and what is the evidence you're going to collect that you're going to make inferences about later on. So it starts when you develop your blueprint. Does your blueprint cover all the standards? Does it cover all the domains? Then you're going to develop item specifications. And do your item specifications allow for examples, examples of items that range in their cognitive processes, if it allows for that standard? Not all standards do. Some, some standards really are low-level standards. Others allow for a range of cognitive processes or linguistic processes, either one. Does it link? But you have to have it embedded right away. If you expect to find that later on, you may find it, but if you don't plan for it, it's just probably not going to happen. So you have to plan in your item specifications, in your item blueprint, in your test blueprint, and then when you do conduct your item reviews with your content committees, who are experts? They're teacher experts from your field. Sometimes they're college professors also in the group of experts who are reviewing the items that are going to be put in your assessment. They have to review them for the content. They have to review them for alignment. Make sure that you are assessing what you're to be assessing. And they also have to review them for the cognitive processes or the linguistic processes that you are purporting to measure. And you should collect that data. You sh that's data coming in from you, into you from experts. You should have review logs and collect that data from all these experts that say, yes, this is in fact uh, at this DOK level, if you're using DOK, they, by the way, there are many, there are several, not many, but several different 
co cognitive complexity models you can use. Uh, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. I think it's your judgment on which fits your purposes better. Not only for the general population of students, but there are models you can use for the alternate population. And yesterday I learned there are several different linguistic models you can use. You pick one that fits your needs, but then follow it all the way through your design. You pick that at the beginning, and you follow it through your design. You keep looking at it and keep referring to it, and each step of the way you're collecting validity evidence. And you keep documenting that and keep a file on it and keep all of your evidence. So when you come to the end and you're doing a study, and part of doing, when you're developing your item specifications, you, if you're doing COG labs, and I recommend you do COG labs. <coughs> I'm recent, I've recently been involved with doing COG labs in the alternate population, which is quite an interesting thing to do. When you're doing them with the gen ed population, you certainly take model, take items from your pool, but take items that you know truly are at the cognitive level that you intend to investigate. And then you present it to students, but make sure your student sample represents the sample of students at uh, your student testing population. Because if you don't have a sample that represents your testing population, you may be collecting skewed evidence. So select a sample that represents your population. It may be geographic and it may be based on high performers, low performers, but find a sample and you have plenty of students in your state that, so, that does represent your general student population. And then you present these items, and beforehand, you have to decide what are your research questions. I mean, what are you really going to research here in your COG lab? What, what evidence do you want? And then plan your data collection instrument to have that evidence, obtain the evidence you want after you've discussed, after the student has looked at the item. So then you plan your COG lab, and you run your COG lab, and we run it rather inexpensively for states by having state personnel actually run the COG labs, but I, we designed them for the state, and the state personnel ran the labs, or trained some select, a selection of teachers to run the COG labs. So it does not necessarily have to be a high ticket item, there are ways to do this that can lower your cost, but you still get information that is instrumental in designing your items, which it should be, and instrumental in deciding if your items are tapping the cognitive processes you, or linguistic processes you really want to tap. Then you're on your way to having a good, valid assessment, an assessment that you can make solid inferences about because you know your item pool that is going to be on your assessment is in fact tapping exactly what you want to assess. And then there are other, of course, there are other independent expert judgments. That's usually done with someone, a research company, or another vendor who is not the vendor you are using for your assessment. And that is all, always useful. That's another way to go about it. And then there are relationships with other measures. That's kind of hard to do. And we found it very difficult, especially with the alternate population. We try to do this, but the problem is there aren't other measures available that tap the same thing, that, that tap what you're attesting with your standards. And not every district in a state uses the same measures to determine if a child belongs in the, in the 
special ed population and should take your alternate assessment. I don't know. It might be possible that there are, in fact, alternate linguistic assessments that measure the same thing, but it's, def it's kind of hard to do that, we have found. Um, if there were those assessments, it's, it would be easier with the general population because there are other assessments in the general population that you can use. But with the specific populations, the alternate population, or the, ling um, the EL population, it's kind of hard to find those measures that are used consistently by other, uh, by other districts within a state that you can actually correlate that data and see if you have a match between what you're assessing and what that other assessment is assessing that purports to measure the same thing. So in the interest of um, continuing the theme of overall validity and all these different types of validity being connected, I'm just going to speak briefly about uh, some of the maybe more familiar types of validity. 3.3, uh, uh, validity evidence based on internal structure, and 3.4, validity evidence based on relations to other variables. And with regard to 3.3, uh, the internal structure, what works well for states, uh, based on what I've seen, is really any analysis where you're showing that there is this straight thread or alignment, if you will, between the theoretical uh, or the theory on which the test is based, the evidence uh, that you gather uh, based on your administration for the relationships between the parts of the test, and the reporting that's done at the end point. And in terms of different types of analyses, I'm personally, as a reviewer, open to exploratory factor analysis, confirmatory factor analysis, uh, correlations among the various measures, as long as that evidence is showing a connection to your underlying theory, and then is also going forward uh, to being aligned with uh, the way that you're reporting the scores. So, I mean, if your idea is that numbers and operations, algebra, geometry, statistics, all are sub areas and then they feed into um, an overall mathematics score uh, then a confirmatory factor analysis showing that that's a good fit might work or also a correlation matrix showing that those uh, are correlated at reasonable degrees and are not highly overlapping this is the type of evidence that works well uh, what doesn't work well from my perspective is when your theory doesn't match uh, those relationships among items or your reporting doesn't match either your theory or those relationships. And that would be the case, for example, uh, if you're building a test on a unidimensional theory and you find through various analyses evidence of unidimensionality, high correlations among scores, and so on and so forth, all those types of evidence that uh, is relevant to evidence based on internal structure validity, but then you want to report subscales at the end, and if those subscales have been shown, for example, to be correlated at 0.85 or 0.9, uh, or you've presented a great deal of evidence indicating that your test score is unidimensional, uh, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. I know that there are pressures from districts uh, and various stakeholders to report those subscales, uh, but if they're not really uh, giving you evidence of different types of scales, if algebra is really no different than geometry and so on and so forth based on what you found, it doesn't really make sense to give that information from that specific test, as an example. Moving on to validity evidence based on relations to other variables, uh, that's sometimes historically been referred to as concurrent validity or convergent or divergent validity, really showing that your scores from your measure uh, relate to other variables in the directions and to the magnitudes that we would expect. And I really like, personally, uh, it, it's either presented in a uh, multi-trait, multi-method framework. It doesn't have to be presented that way, although sometimes when I get the evidence, uh, I tend to look and see if I can piece it together that way. Uh, a lot of times there's correlational evidence. Uh, sometimes there's other types of evidence based on relations to other variables, and that's fine, like uh, agreement indices, conditional probability indices, 
uh, kappa and that type of thing. But when I see those correlations, I really want to see uh, with those other measures whether those magnitudes of correlations within construct but across different batteries exceed those correlations within battery uh, across cons constructs. And so to lay those, that out, I know many of you are probably familiar with multi-trait multi-method. Uh, some of you may be less familiar. Think about like a two-by-two two matrix. And you have your scores from your large-scale assessment in math and reading. Uh, and then you also have scores from an, uh, an interim assessment uh, that happens to give you reading and math global scores. So you have a two-by-two two matrix. Which is really good evidence is when you see those correlations between the two reading scores or those correlations between the two math scores be at higher magnitudes, hopefully a lot higher magnitudes, but at least to be at higher magnitudes than those scores that are within method. So if your uh, large scale scores for reading and math correlate higher uh, than your scores uh, for reading uh, across measures, reading interim with large scale reading, uh, or the, the complementary example, that is problematic because that's showing that those magnitudes of relationships are more based on the source or the test that they come from rather than reflecting uh, the construct or what is intended to be measured. So uh, with that, uh, those are my comments on overall validity and I think that concludes our prepared constructs and we'll take hopefully questions from the audience. Actually, I have something that, uh, mm -hmm. Is it on? Okay. Yeah, so it was um, another, uh, one other thing I wanted to add, which is um, response processes covers cognitive processes, but also another kind of, of aspect of responding that's not really related to the construct, but can get in the way of the construct. And this is uh, a particularly uh, important with new item formats. So uh, you, uh, in one of the research questions that you may investigate in a cognitive lab, which I have seen programs do this that use TEIs, um, is, um, is not something related specifically to a targeted cognitive process, but just to make sure that the students understand the directions for responding. Um, because if a student is responding to a multiple choice, multiple select item in the same way that they would respond to a multiple choice item, then they're using a response process or implicit assumptions of, of a response process that's going to hurt them. So it's, it's, um, it's uh, uh, something I think that's uh, really important to investigate if you have unfamiliar un or unusual item formats I think every, you know, most people assume that students know how to respond to multiple choice, traditional multiple choice items. They understand that there's only one answer, one response that's credited, and the rest, the others are, um, you know, not, not applicable, um, and that they have to choose only one. But beyond that, um, I, sometimes students will uh, not understand the response processes even after they've been tutored on these types of items, so um, it's, it's, a, th it's um, uh, a threat to validity, um, but I think it falls under the rubric of response processes um, and probably like 3.2 um, uh, arena. I think that's a very good point, and COG Labs can help you find this information out. You really, I mean, it's, it's very, Oh, um, you really like to include all these different item types. Some of them are really jazzy looking and they're exciting and look what fun we can have on our test. But do they really work? I mean, are you really getting the information that you want from these item types? Are students using the cognitive processes you think they're using to answer these item formats. So I think that it's a very important point. Once you start playing with all these new jazzy new item types, run a cog lab. Doesn't have to be a huge number of students. 
run a, a small cog lab can be an informal cog lab, but it's telling you if your item formats are in fact working, are they the right choice to make for this particular, for the particular information you're trying to obtain? Maybe a plain old multiple choice is a better option. And so, yes, I, I think you make a very strong point here. It's nice to be different, it's nice to be new, but are you really collecting the evidence that you want to collect? So I've seen the uh, unidimensionality problem a lot uh, coming up, and I was just wondering maybe, Will, you could address what it should a state do where they have issues with uh, unidimensionality? What kind of uh, remedies should the state take part in? Right. Uh, right. This, this, uh, this question came up. The, the, this this uh, concern came up in the um, original panel on this, uh, and uh, I I made I made the comment, and it's just for me. Um, it doesn't represent the department's opinion, or but I uh, I don't see anything in the. Um, I, I think that um, many submitters, uh, many submissions come with the assumption that their total test score has to be based on a unidimensional scale and that they have to have subscores and, and of course the requirements, the technical requirements for the uh, subscores to be independently reliable and distinct from each other and distinct from the total score is a really, really hard um, uh, requirement to, to, to meet in every case. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough one and we see this, um, this um, and I've seen this in many, many submissions, but I just, um, uh, want to uh, say that I, I don't think that that has to be the model for um, you know uh, uh, testing programs that want to have subscores and wa and obviously need a total score. Uh, the total score does not have to be based on a unidimensional scale. Um, there are other options. Um, uh, c it could be based on a multidimensional model or a um, a composite. Um, where the uh, individual components are the things that you report your subscores on. So uh, I, uh, I, I think that there are, you know, um, possibilities for meeting those two, um, um, you know, uh, targets, right? The, the uh, uh, reliable total score and, um, and having subscores. There are other parameters, <laughs> right? Uh, testing time and numbers of items and, and things like that, but at least from the point of view of um, getting, getting a reliable total score and at the same time reliable and independent uh, subscores, there, there are, there are, there's multiple avenues. Got a, <coughs> a two-part question and um, unrelated. So the first one is, is it as simple as adding to your item review committee, you know, our, our uh, item review sheets, our, our data says, or our um, evidence says, the, me the uh, members have to say, hey, is it, what's the cognitive level? Does it align to the standards? Is it a simple saying is, does the item tap the intended cognitive? And yes or no, is that a yes or no question or is there supposed to be more on the item review sheet. I'm, I'm trying to avoid the expense of a cog lab. I don't think that'll get you quite what you want. It's not quite the same as a cog lab. 
but you can ask, you know, you can put more, if you want more, in, the more information you get, the more information you have. You can ask, what do you think the student has to do to answer this question, which is getting at what is the process they're using to answer this question. Yeah, and, and just from a practitioner standpoint, that's kind of what you're doing during item review, right? The teachers have that discussion and they're going to Well, they're a gonna lot of times it just reject. comes down to wording. So. I mean, teachers, I mean, I've been to many, many, many. I, I've been in this business 30 years. I've been to uh, many item reviews. And teachers spend all their time discussing the wording and very little time discussing the cognitive process that is being used. I think you have to force that discussion and include it in part of your review process, but ask them, so what is the cognitive process the student has to use to answer this question? What do you think the thinking process is the student will use? Do you think that's valid for this? Is this reasonable? Does it align with what you want the student to do? And so I think if you, know, you don't ask, you don't get, basically. Okay, so cog labs it is. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> so, so Vince, I, I just want to add that, you know, I think that's part of the process, but really what you want to do is you want to confirm that those expectations that the teacher had about the cognitive complexity are actually the experiences the students have. So I think that's the piece that's missing. And when, in peer review, you know, you want to have that, those steps of, as a state, those assumptions going in, but uh, I've seen in the peer review process that, that really to confirm that those processes, you know, are studied and looked at. Okay. Um, and, I, I, thanks, Jeff. Uh, and I'd like to, I, I think that uh, the comments that June and, and Jeff made, I would definitely uh, agree with those. There's a lot of different types of evidence, and I, I know that Ed doesn't want to be prescriptive about a certain type of evidence uh, for a certain type of area. And so uh, cognitive or think aloud labs, uh, I also think that surveys, uh, maybe terminology, but surveys like right afterwards, asking students, uh, what were you thinking about when you completed this item, that type of thing, uh, can contribute to this area. There's other types of evidence, like sp specific types of distractor analysis. If you really get into building the argument around looking at what those incorrect answer choices on a multiple choice question might be and how you made decisions about uh, percentages, uh, recording how long a student spends on an item on like a uh, computer-based test. Although I think that those types of evidence are on a lower tier, they're not as strong, and thus you end up having to make much more of an argument about how those fit into telling about cognitive processes. I'm also sympathetic that 3.2, not just in this area, but really across assessment, uh, that validity evidence based on response processes tends to be some of the hardest and most expensive to gather. Uh, some things that I personally would suggest, and you know, as Will indicated earlier, like this is just me, like from my perspective, is it doesn't have to be a large sample. It needs to be a representative sample of items, a representative sample of uh, kids, uh, students with different uh, sort of academic backgrounds, uh, representative uh, set of grades. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the large sample that you have for your reliability or inter internal structure validity evidence. And uh, I'll just put in a plug uh, in general from academia as somebody uh, you know, who has advisees that are constantly looking for data, uh, be open to the possibility that you can get a student who might be, want to be involved with doing some of this work and leading some of this work uh, for a thesis or a dissertation. We can charge them and offset the cost. So, <laughs> uh, so, so the, the just one <laughs> comment about distractor yeah. analysis. Distractor analysis is wonderful if your distractors really test different things and they're not uh, sort of throwaway distractors. If you have thoughtfully planned your distractors and in science, if you have put in mis true, val true misconceptions, true, that's kind of a misnomer, but uh, <laughs> a misconception that is a plausible misconception of that content, uh, 
then yes, look at the distractor analysis and it's going to tell you something. Usually it works better with math items, actually, because then you can put in different ways to do those numbers that are in the item. I mean, if it's asking for multipli multiplication, did they add, did they subtract, did they do something else? Or if you have a multi-step uh, item, did they do only part of the item? So it usually works better in math. It's kind of hard to do in ELA because um, actually finding distractors that are at a different cognitive level or it, it's kind of hard to do. It's kind, then it kind of, the key just kind of just stands right out there. So it doesn't really work as well, I find, with ELA, but it, it can work wonderfully with math, but you have to plan that ahead of time. I mean, it has to be there. You're not going to find what's not there. So you have to plan that ahead of time, and you can definitely, I've seen it work in math and science, not as well in ELA or social studies. Okay. Last part, a separate question. I'm going to sit down so people don't have to look at my back. Um, part of our alternate assessment includes a, a data folio or portfolio, centrally scored. How do you, what kind of evidence if you have any experience in that, would you, would you submit or look at to, to get that approved for a cognitive process? Okay, I'll take a stab. Um, what I'd want to know is if you allow, there are different kinds of portfolios. You can have a portfolio where it is highly prescriptive. You have only certain things that you can do, but it's a a collection of student evidence. But you have been very prescriptive about what evidence you're going to collect. Um, then you can formulate what they're going to collect beforehand. Think about the cognitive processes, think about the standards that you're assessing, and you can have a committee come in and look at it and make sure they agree with what you're doing. But then there are a lot of portfolios where you give the, stu the teachers the standards, and I've seen this done. They get, okay, you're going to test this standard and this standard. And then it's up to them to find evidence during the course of the year. And so they collect student evidence during the course of the year. It's really a teacher finding game rather than a student production game. And then I think you're going to have a harder time with validity because you really don't know how this evidence was collected or under what conditions. And it's, it's, that, that's like a hard sell to me. I would have a hard time with that. You can also include in the portfolio, at least for some students, um, the um, interim products for, and not just the final. And uh, especially, well, if the standard uh, 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 to which that particular uh, part of the portfolio is addressing, if it specifies a particular process. That, say, a, a, a writing standard that um, includes, um, uh, you know, that states that a student will, you know, sh should be able to uh, organize their writing from a um, outlining phase to a draft phase to a you know final uh, product. Well, you can collect that process. You can collect the interim products in that process, and that that is that is process data. That is um, you know a student process data. an alignment study and the results show areas of weakness, what should that state do and what should it provide in its submission for uh, assessment peer review? If you find areas of weakness, I think then you should provide in your submission what you intend to do about it, how you intend to remediate that, what are your plans, and a timeline. When is this going to happen? When, is this, when are you going to achieve your end goal? 
So I think those two components need to be present. What am I going to do and how, how long is it going to take me to get there? Yeah, in my experience as a peer reviewer, that's 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 always been the the um, recommendation of people in in that situation. Uh, that that's what we want to see, you know. And is it there? So, yeah, I, I mean, I think this goes to you know states really communicating uh, to the peers and using the space available, and you know, sort of being proactive in saying, look. You know, this is the evidence we have. Uh, we think it's pretty good, but this is, you know, we're working on this phase. And I think that goes better than having the peers find out about it when they're reviewing the material and go, you know, what's going on here. So I, I think, it, you know, there's also, it's that timeline, but it's also the communication aspect of, you know, just letting them know that, you know, the state knows. <laughs> because if you don't do that, then it looks like you think everything's, you know, good. Yeah, I think that almost uh, all of the variance in terms of how states uh, uh, are evaluated, in my experience, on this variable has to do with uh, that plan and that timeline uh, that my colleagues are referring to. So almost everybody has an alignment report. Almost everybody has some weaknesses in that alignment report. Uh, as June was mentioning, you need a plan, you need a timeline. Uh, best case scenario that I'm looking for is at the end of that timeline, uh, how are you going to have either the, the newly developed revised test independently reviewed again, or at least your changes that you've made independently reviewed so that it's not all internal? And what are some strategies uh, for dealing with resistance to an external alignment study? Um, you know, there might be privacy or test security concerns on the part potentially of a vendor. How should a state approach that? Independent alignment studies have been done since I started in the industry. And no, uh, I would be surprised if a vendor ever blocked this. It only helps. and. If you're confident in the process that you've used to develop these items, I don't see why you would be upset. Speaking as a vendor, I'm never upset. Uh, why would you be upset about an independent alignment study? And if they do find something, well, now you know you have something to that you should attend to and add that to your process and attend to it. I, you know. This to me is just part of the normal process. It shouldn't be a big deal at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the bigger concern for states is potentially cost or, you know, because alignment size can be expensive, doing it for how many grade levels. That's really, I think, the thing that uh, is preventive. Uh, you know, I agree, you know, it is a state's test and the states, <laughs> in my opinion, you know, can go and have it independently aligned regardless of the vendor. And, you know, it's been done you know, the security agreements have been signed. But I don't think that's the biggest factor. I think it's the cost um, that is, you know, preventative for, for states. In your remarks, Will, you talked about um, being focused and thoughtful about the sampling for a cognitive lab, so about which items, I assume, as well as, you know, which students. What are some key considerations that a state should which items would be involved in a, in a cod lab? I think they should, um, I, I think one key consideration um, is, well, don't necessarily start with the items, go back to the standards and look at the standards that specifically imply particular cognitive processes um, and be selective first at that level. Um, um, and then, and then, of course, since the items are written to, um, usually they're linked to one and only one standard, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. sometimes they may be linked to more than one. Um, uh, uh, work with that set, uh, that set of items, and sample from that set of items. So, um, uh, so one key consideration is um, <coughs> looking, uh, uh, looking at the standards first. Um, 
and uh, um, uh, Ryan has mentioned others that um, uh, uh, sampling from um, a broad sample of students. Uh, it doesn't have to be a large sample, but it should be it should be representative. Uh, uh, yeah, those say the, those two. Um, I agree with everything you said, but uh, the one problem that usually comes up and that I've had come up with states is their item pool is small and closely guarded. And if they choose items from one standard, the problem is they'll deplete the number. Once you do, once you use the items for a cog lab, you really have to consider them released. They're not as secure uh, other people have looked at them, seen them. It's not a secure item. Uh, states are then reluctant to put th such an item on their summary assessment. So part of the deal is that you have to worry about the item pool. And so you may want a separate sample. W you, What I ask the states to do is when we are creating your practice test, Let's be very thoughtful about the items on that practice test, because they will be released. They will be out there. And let's make sure we designate the items that we're using for our COG lab, because COG lab should happen up front. I mean, that should happen. It shouldn't be at the end of the process. It should be at the beginning of the process. And so let's use a certain set of items and designate those items we know we're going to use them in COG labs, so they will be on your practice test. And that's one way to alleviate the, w the cost of depleting your pool, your operational pool, which states do not like to do. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, you know, when you look at the validity evidence, um, I, I, I think states get caught. Um, because if you are going out with a new contract or something, you know, there are these elements for peer review that you could sort of specifically state and, and work out from the beginning. Because obviously, you know, I think as we all said here, planning is really important to get this information, some of the stuff sort of up front. You know, the problem is if you have a contract, you're two to three years to it and you're trying to, you know, go back. And I, I think that makes it a little more difficult for states, um, you know, and potentially a little bit more expensive for states. But if, if you can plan ahead some of these studies or put it into your contract if you're going out, I think the process makes it a lot easier um, to, to complete. But, you know, there are, you know, contracts are all over the place, and I think states trying to, you know, wrap around. And I think that's why the story of how the state collects the validity evidence and, and, their, and what they say um, is really important um, when providing the for the peer reviews. Great point. Anyone have any further questions? I think the panel focused all, a lot on some of the positive things that states have done well. What are sort of the biggest issues you've encountered when you're reviewing uh, these portions of the peer review submission? Well, I think, um, you know, I think the biggest thing is sort of a data dump. Um, they just sort of, you know, throw all this stuff. It's not really labeled, and they expect, you know, us to go through it and to find all the pieces. And sometimes, you know, that is multiple manuals, large technical manuals. Uh, you know, I think the organization and, and really the focus, and that's why, you know, I keep saying the states sort of have their story, and then they can provide the evidence. It really helps, I would say, us sort of read and understand the information. But when they don't really say much and they just sort of, I call it sort of a data dump, it makes it hard to sort of figure out, you know, put the pieces together. Because really you got to look at this, um, you know, as a whole, um, and there's a lot of aspects to it. And I know, you know, you look at each critical element, but, you know, if you have the story, um, you know, the validity evidence and your argument there, it makes, it makes everything a lot easier to read and to understand. 